good morning. Happy Sunday. Welcome again to Warrington Bible Fellowship and the opportunity afforded us by our mighty God to worship him again. We will engage and indulge in that wonderful ancient Christian tradition of announcements. Isn't that odd? We announce things first, but that's just the way we do it sometimes, isn't it? I've been informed recently that the Women's Tuesday Bible Study resumes uh, in the new year, and the Wednesday night Bible study, or the Wednesday Bible study, I'm sorry, for women is completed. The Titus study is complete. Uh, we'll look maybe for a renewal of another one of those titles so far. Also, when it comes for announcements, the Christmas Eve service will be on the... Just checking. Yes, that would be a Christmas Eve service on the 24th. Uh, it's going to be at 4 p.m. here in the big room. And there's going to be a cookie reception on the 19th, am I correct, at 10 o'clock next week. So uh, bring a cookie, exchange a cookie, eat a cookie, and be very cookie-like as you do that. What a wonderful and beautiful um, season we are approaching as we do celebrate that moment when the king of the universe mysteriously and powerfully enters his creation as the God-man Jesus of Nazareth. Are there any other announcements that anyone would like to tell me about? Not one. Um, anyway, if it, I'm hoping that you guys get me the same thing for Christmas that you got me last year. Just wrap it this year, please. Thank you very much. Just a joke. Now, remember, everything we do in this hour is about worship. Announcements is about worship. Singing is about worship. Reading scripture is about worship. Being here together in this room is all about worship. And God gives us again the opportunity to come together in his realm to do those things of eternal value. So before we begin this worship, let's prepare the mind and the heart that the Lord God gives us and wants us to use for his sake. Pray with me, will you? Mighty one, we know that you and you alone are God. That you are the one who has no beginning and no end. That you are the one to whom all power is ascribed and all knowledge the genius of your creative urge we acknowledge. And we know, mighty God, that you know our hearts and our minds. Our thoughts, before they become even words, are yours. Inhabit our praise this day, O oh God. Remind us of who you are and who we are in you. And remind us also, Father, that there are those among us who are hurting, who are wounded, who you want to touch through us. Mighty God, make us sensitive to that work. Bring us together for the sake of your name and your blessed Son, our Savior and Champion. This season, Mighty One, is like all seasons. As we said last week, all our days are good because our good God is the God of our days. Hear our prayers. Glorify yourself in these moments. And we do ask all these things in the name of Jesus the Christ, saying together, Amen. We're going to have Lois and Peter Ristow come up and do the Advent. Candle, which represents hope. The second candle is the Bethlehem candle, which represents faith. And the third candle that we light today is the shepherd's candle, which reminds us of the shepherds who receive the good news and the joy that each one of us can have in the hearing and the sharing of the good news of our Savior's birth. And we read of that good news in Luke chapter 2, verse, starting at verse 8 through 20. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes 
and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was, an angel, was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that they had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary measured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Thus is the word of the Lord. Let's rise and worship the Lord together. Crown him with many crowns, the king who left his throne, creator of the universe, born to the strong breath, the Word has become flesh, Emmanuel has come to us, oh crown him all the earth. Crowned by the angel choir, they tell his royal birth. Oh, crown him all the world. Crowned by the royal gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, wise men approach this manger throne with honors from afar. Behold the Son of God, down in this place, the Prince of Peace has come to us. Oh, crown him with your praise. Crown him with many crowns. Shepherds feared and trembled 
When low above the earth rang out the angel chorus that hailed our Savior's birth. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Down in the lonely manger, the humble Christ was born. And God sent us salvation that blessed Christmas morn. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. On the mountain, over the hills and everywhere, go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is
Thank you, guys. I just love Go Tell in the Mountain, don't you? Let's have a seat, shall we? You're still glowing, you guys. Just stand there while you're glowing. I'm just kidding. You can have a seat also. I was. I was just mesmerized for a moment. We are a singing people, aren't we? Amen. We are a singing people. Now, each week, we also acknowledge the opportunity that our God and King provides for us in His kingdom to reinvest that which He's given us back into His kingdom. But that just doesn't mean our material wealth. You know that, right? I mean, every gift comes from above. And all gifts are the light of Him that gives them to us. So, that means that you and I have many, many gifts to share. And that includes prayer. You know, we had a pretty significant weather front come through our area yesterday with some high winds. But back further west of the Mississippi, this front basically went, it arced from New Orleans all the way up into New England. It's a big front. And caused quite a bit of damage with some tornadoes that were spawned by this front. So in these moments, not only then can we acknowledge the opportunity and the privilege of giving back to God that which he's given us, to learn to live on his margin, and all the gifts he's given us return to them, that means also the gift of prayer for those who have been hurt and have suffered loss, even because of our fallen biosphere's nature patterns, which are not going to be like this when our king returns. It will all be restored on that seventh day beauty of very good, isn't it? And we look forward to that, don't we? So as we pray again and acknowledge the beauty and the opportunity to give online, to give in the boxes, or to mail in your offering and your tithe, we can also remember that he has given us the opportunity not just to pray for others, but to perhaps help them physically. So as we pray today, let's open our hearts to the might and the beauty of God's will for us and our compassion for those who have been hurt and suffered loss this week in the tornadoes. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we've asked this many times, who are we? Who are we that you would condescend into this realm, ruined by our own crimes against you? That you, within your unfailing love, then put your thumb on us, and by the blood of your blessed Son, bring us back into right relationship, and then say, you now have the privilege of investing in the kingdom work that is forever. Thank you for that privilege and the opportunity. And also, mighty one, we pray, although not by name, for those who were hurt and suffered loss in the tornadoes yesterday. Thank you for being with them. And if there is any means by which you would desire us to aid them, please let us know that we might glorify you, Lord, in all these things. Worship you first, and know that you are indeed our God. For again, it is in the precious name of your Son, who is indeed our champion and our Savior, who forever is our advocate, we say together, Amen. And Amen. We will continue in worship this morning with catechism. And remember, last week we began our look at the Ten Commandments. And too often you and I look at these ten outstanding and stunning ideas as just, well, it's just history. You know, we've heard about the Ten Commandments so much in our culture that it almost, as a body of thought, has lost its meaning. So what we want to do in these next few weeks is to bring that meaning back. To make these words alive again in the life we live. Remember, I challenged you last week. Maybe you'd like to learn or relearn those Ten Commandments. In your own words, by the way. So that you can have them in your heart. And as we learn their real purpose and what they're really for, they become more powerful to us, don't they? So our question this morning is, if you'd like to read it with me. Ready? What does God require in the first, second, and third commandments? First, that we know God as the only true God. Second, that we avoid all idolatry. Third, that we treat God's name with fear and reverence. Those three ideas reflect back to us God's very character. His very character is included in these three commands. Did you know that God's reality, authority, and superiority are reflected in the first commandment? That would be his omniscience. He knows everything. In the second commandment, God's unquestioned universal status as the one true and only God. He is 
the true and only God. He's all-powerful. He's omnipotent. And you know, if the first commandment is true, then the second one has to be followed, right? Oh, they're connected, aren't they? How about this? In the third commandment, God's totally unique and unrivaled name is omnipresence because all men, as we learn in Romans 2, know God and they know his name. So God's name is his identity and also that means he's known to all people. So he's everywhere present. So in these first three commandments, we learn a lot about who our God is. And as we continue to look at the Ten Commandments, again, I would encourage you to relearn them or learn them on your own so that you can recite them to yourself or to another. But be aware of the fact that our God's very character is reflected in these first three commandments. So let's ask the question again, shall we? What does God require in the first, second, and third commandments? First, that we know God as the only true God. Second, that we avoid all idolatry. Third, that we treat God's name with fear and reverence. Amen. Let's continue worshiping then, shall we? Thank you, Jimmy. I'd like you to turn to the book of Luke. And I know what you're thinking. Isn't he going to do a Christmas series? This is it. (laughs) Okay. So I'd like to turn to Luke chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 26 through 56 this morning. I promise to have you out by 4 o'clock. I was 12 years old, and my mom and dad came to me, sat me down about two, three weeks before Christmas, and they said, what do you want for Christmas? They had this really serious look on their face. I'm thinking, toys? (laughs) And and, uh, my first answer was, toys. You know, and they said, well, you know, you're getting to be a young man. We thought maybe you want something different than toys. Well, I wasn't quite there yet. And so I asked for toys. Now, I, I look back on that, and I, as I got older, you know, my idea of Christmas began to change, began to, I, I, I hope, evolve into something nicer. But it, it makes me wonder, because I, I remember that moment where, is there something other than toys? And so my question for you this morning is, what, is, what does Christmas mean to you? You know, to a lot of people, it means gifts. Some people, it means family. Some people, it means warm times, big meals, fond memories. Maybe a little bit of extra time off for some folks. It's not an easy time of year. We need to recognize that as well. But I've always felt, and those of you who have been with us for a while know how I feel about Christmas. It's it's as if the world just settles down for a moment, catches its breath. There's something about the day that causes us to, to look inward, maybe upward, to silence all the noise and consider, consider our place in the grand scheme of things. I kind of like that, but I don't know if that's what Christmas is about. Is Christmas about each of us looking inward, finding our identity, finding some meaning and purpose? Is it about, is it about me? Is it about you? Is it about how we live? Or is Christmas about something bigger? Something bigger than me. We need to think about this. Christmas is certainly about gifts. I mean, we give them. We receive them. And that should be a reminder that all the gifts we've been given come from God. Think about it. At, at, at Christmas, we should be reminded of the things that God has given us. And they're, they're profound. They're, they, they are cosmic. They are life-changing. Number one, God has revealed Himself to us. It's incredible. The Creator of the universe has revealed Himself to you and me. He's illuminated our spirits. He's not just said, I'm here. He's begun to roll out His character and nature to those of us who believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Who He is. How He functions. He's taken on flesh. 
God took on flesh and came down here and lived with us. We call it the incarnation. But what it means is it became like us. That's enough to cause you some, some concern over time. And on top of all of that, God has reconciled Himself to those that believe in, in His Son. God has renewed the relationship between Him and those He created. Us. They're incredible gifts. Beautiful things that God has given us. And Christmas, maybe that's why it seems like the world settles down for a little bit. I mean, everybody knows what Christmas is. Atheists will say, well, I don't wish anybody a Merry Christmas. I wish them happy holidays. But they're thinking Christmas. Not a bad word. All these things should come to our mind in a profound way. But, but how, how do we respond? How do we respond to the gifts that God has given us? How do we properly receive gifts on that magnitude? Well, I'm here to tell you, we do it in faith. Amen? Oh, come on, guys. We do it in faith. Amen? Okay, so what is that? What is faith? Is it some warm, tingly feeling? Does it come upon us suddenly? Does it make us super spiritual, superheroes in the, in the biblical realm? Do some folks have more of it than others? How do we know it when we see it? How do we understand it when we feel it? This is part one of a two-part series for Christmas. And the title of this sermon is, All I Want for Christmas Is... This is part one. Faith. Faith. Let's take a look at a young girl named Mary. And how, and how she exercised her faith. How she walked through a difficult situation. It's easy to think that Mary was particularly blessed. Some people have built a whole religion upon it. But we can learn a lot by carefully watching how she walks through this new situation. And she hears the news that her life is about to change. And if you know the story, you know that her life is about to change. Maybe not for the good. Maybe there's a hardship coming upon Mary. So I'm going to go through the whole passage here, starting in Luke chapter 1, verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled by this saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I'm a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now, in those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. I just want to stop there for a second. When does life begin? The baby leaped in her womb. 
when he heard Mary approach. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and she claimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he's looked upon the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name, and his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. So, so there we are. It's the Christmas story, right? How does Mary exercise her faith? If we read this very carefully, and, and we see that it might not have been as easy as it might first seem at a, at a cursory glance. After all, don't most of us think that Mary's visited by an angel who tells her what's going to happen and she's going to bear a child and he will be the son of God and then everything is fine in Mary's life until he becomes an adult. That's kind of what tradition tells us. It's kind of what our little manger scenes underneath our trees and on our mantles say. Don't a lot of our Christmas carols point us in, in that general direction? This is fantastic. This is wonderful. God is moving, and we're all happy. But let's take a look. Let's take a look at what the text says. With just a, a little bit of imagination and just a little bit of reading between the lines, I think we can get an accurate, if not traditional, view on how Mary handles all this as a young teen, teenage girl. I think it's easy to forget that Mary was probably 15 years old, maybe 16. All this rolls out in seven steps. First, Mary struggled. Mary struggled in verse 29. You're going to have to keep your, your Bibles open on this, but in verse 29 of chapter 1, it says she's greatly troubled. Why? Why is she greatly troubled? Well, you know, Mary knew her scriptures, and the visit from the angel is monumental. It is not unimportant. Mary knew what the Bible said. Angels in the Old Testament, when they appeared, meant that there was some change coming. God was sending a messenger directly from heaven, and what he had to say would either be life changing or world changing. Why, Mary? Why now in this little backwater town in northern Israel? And we should be reminded as we see this of all the hard decisions we've had to make. Trying to determine what's right and what's wrong and how desperately we need wisdom from somewhere other than ourselves to make the right decision. And even when we get it, even when we receive the, that, that wisdom, sometimes we're still unsure of what we do to do, aren't we? That's what Mary's going through. She's heard this news. She's not quite sure what to do with it. Mary's just like us. She knows something big is about to transpire, and she's not exactly sure how to receive it. Not exactly sure what to do about it. When she hears it, it is indeed life-changing. And for Mary, maybe not in a good way, but it's world-changing as well. She's going to have a baby. And the baby is going to be the Son of God. Boy, that's a phrase that just kind of rolls off our backs. We're so accustomed to it. Mary's the first person to hear it. What do you do with this? Son of God. Well, she does receive it. 
But look at this. She doesn't do it all at once. She has some perfectly valid questions. What's going on here? I believe deep down inside, Mary would like to just accept what the angel has to say blindly and go forward. But none of us really accept news like that blindly and going forward. We all have questions, don't we? Look at Mary's circumstances. She's a young girl. We would call her engaged, betrothed. You know, back then, if you're betrothed, it's just the first step in being married. You're considered obligated, committed to somebody. They haven't been intimate. And the angel says, you're going to have a baby. Whoa. How's this going to happen? She don't sure how to deal with it. So she asks in 134, how, how is this going to be? She doesn't fully understand. She wants more information. What we should see here is that Mary didn't just jump in with both feet. Mary's second step was she took some time. She needed to absorb it. She had questions. Took things step by step. She was cautious. And, and we, we need to see this, not that, that her questions are not a sign of doubt. They show faith. Maybe with a little bit of trepidation. Maybe even a little bit of fear. You ever had enough faith to know that God was moving? You ever had enough faith to know that God was moving, but you might be just a little bit apprehensive about where he might be moving you, what he might be doing in your life. That's exactly how Mary felt. The angel's gentle. He's understanding. He's compassionate. He answers her heartfelt questions completely. And as that happens, look at how Mary reacts, our third step. She demonstrates simple acceptance. Verse 38 says, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Now, now, Mary's not jumping up and down and dancing here. She's yielding. Maybe not sure what to do, but she wants to be obedient. So she chooses to believe what the angel says. Maybe a little bit overwhelmed by her situation. Maybe a little unsure of exactly what's happening. But it's hard to deny when an angel is standing in front of you that there's something big going on. And when he gives us news, it's hard to deny that something's big going on in you. So Mary begins to move forward. But you can hear in her response, she's still unsure of what it all means. Trying to absorb it, trying to process it. But still, she moves out in faith. And that's our fourth step. She acts. The angel had told her that Elizabeth was with child. And in 39, she goes there. She sets out to visit the only other person in the entire world that may have some understanding of what she's going through. Elizabeth was barren. And now she's with child. Not knowing what's going to happen, Mary acts upon the truth that she's heard. Now we all understand how hard this part of Mary's story can be. We've all had the experience, maybe we haven't been visited by an angel, maybe we haven't had writing on the wall, but we've all had the experience of reading God's Word and then being challenged to do what it says. If you haven't had that experience, come and see me afterwards. <laughs> I'm always stumbling over things in the Bible. I go, does it really say that? Do I really have to do that? God calls us to do hard things, doesn't he? The rewards can be great, but that doesn't mean that the hard things are any easier. They're hard things because they're difficult. So Mary wraps up all of her doubts and questions and begin to move on what she believes to be true. And at that point, as Mary begins to act upon the truth that she's heard, 
Miraculous things begin to happen. In verses 42 through 44, she has this personal experience with the babies leaping leaping in in Elizabeth's womb. Elizabeth is saying, the Lord has told you these things. Uh, The baby leaping in her womb affirms them. Uh, I mean, these are all miracles. She experiences a change. That's our fifth step. It's not profound. It's not huge, but it's enough to encourage her that it's all real. That God is moving. That somebody else has just affirmed what I heard. All Mary needed was a small blessing, a small voice that whispered to her soul, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. All she needed was a moment of comfort. There are no lightning flashes. There there are no fire from heaven, no angelic chorus. Just some small encouragement coming from someone she knew to be a godly person affirming what the angel said. You know, when we find ourselves in those situations, we don't need much. We don't need to know the end of the road. All we really need to know is whether or not the next step we're taking is in the will of God. And then we have to trust Him for the rest of the journey. And Mary understands this at a tender age and has an incredible impact upon her. Think about the role that you play in the people around you and the encouragement you can give them. Think about the blessing that you can be with just a small word of kindness and compassion. Mary receives that blessing. And Elizabeth calls Mary blessed. And i got to believe that in her heart, Mary remembers what the angel said. Greetings, O favored one. And look what happens. In verse 46 and verse 47, Mary says, My soul magnifies, my spirit rejoices. And that's the sixth step that Mary takes. She pours her heart out in praise and thanks to her Father in heaven. She gives thanks to her God for what He's doing, regardless of what it means to her reputation, regardless of what it means to her reputation with her family, her loved ones, regardless of not knowing how it's all going to end, God is moving in her life and she gives Him praise. It's an incredible moment. And look, look what Mary's attitude of praise and thanks does in verse 48 and 49. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And the seventh step that Mary takes is she is awestruck by the presence of God. She's completely surrendered to her father at that point. How do we respond to the the gifts that God's given us? We respond in faith. Well, what does that look like? How does that faith feel? How can we know when it's, it's in action in our lives? We just saw that it's not quite as mystical as some people believe. God's not waving some magic wand over people and turning them into faithful people. We just watched Mary walk through maybe one of the most difficult situations we see in the Bible. And we found out what Mary knew. Some participation is required. There are things that Mary has to do. Oh, there are plenty of people out there to tell you all you got to do is get saved. You never have to do anything. Good enough. You know what? I think that's true. I think that once you surrender yourself to the Lord, that the Holy Spirit moves upon you. Jesus says, nothing can snatch him from my hand. He says, Father, I haven't lost any you've given to me. But if you want to grow, if you want to walk in the peace and the blessing and the fullness of a relationship with Jesus Christ, who's your mediator to the Father, if you want to, if you want to grow in that and if you want to go through life without all of this hardship and all this anguish and all this worry and all this pain and everything, then you got to do something. you got to move on your faith. can't just let it sit there. That's what we saw Mary do. 
Faith isn't a feeling. Brothers and sisters, faith is not a feeling. Faith is trust in God's Word and acting upon it as if it's true, moving forward on it, even though we're not exactly sure of where it's all going. What does participation look like? It looks like Mary's seven steps. She struggled with it. And because she was struggling, she took her time. And because she took her time, she got to the point to where she accepted it. And then she acted upon it. And as she acted upon it, she was able to sense a change. She was able to feel a change in her. And because she was changing, she praised God. And as she released that praise and thanks to her father, she was awestruck by God. That's what we need, brothers and sisters. We need to be awestruck by God. We need to be awestruck. We need to be filled with His glory in everything that He's done for us. And as we look at Christmas, we're going to have to look at gifts. Yes, it's not about gifts, but it is about gifts, is it not? It's about these incredible gifts that God has given us by His grace. We haven't done anything to earn them. We're not worthy of Him. He gives us gifts because He's God. And in our, in our humble, totally senseless way, we give gifts to other people because we feel that we've received something. And I'm here to tell you today that if you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, if you recognize that your sin has separated you from the Father, Acknowledge Him as the Son of God. Repent. Then you have received the greatest gift that anybody can ever imagine. Eternity with God in heaven. Now I love that. But there's another side to it, isn't there? Because if you reject that gift, it's not like you just, well, none of my friends are going to heaven. You reject that gift, the consequences are horrific. Eternal conscious torment. See, it's not just the gift that God's given us. Salvation in Christ alone. It's what he saved us from. Oh, and brothers and sisters, that should cause us to be thankful. That should cause us to give him praise and thanks in everything that we do. Twelve years old, I wanted toys. I'm not so sure that that's changed all that much. Kelly says, what do you want for Christmas? What am I thinking? Toys. I just pray that as, as we continue to move down this path that we realize that our desire for toys, maybe you don't have it. Our desire for toys is really revealing a deeper desire in us, a desire to be complete, a desire to be sustained, a desire for a deeper emotional experience and a deeper relationship with our Father in heaven, and he's given us that gift in Jesus Christ. Merry Christmas. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the incomparable gift of your Son. We thank you, Father, that you choose to bring glory to yourself by saving us. And Lord, that we get caught up in that blessing of, of you bringing glory to yourself and that drags us kicking and screaming sometimes, Father, into glory ourselves. We give you thanks, Father. We give you praise. We thank you for this time of year, Lord, when our thoughts turn towards you and pray that we can focus on you and the incredible gift you've given us. And we pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you for tuning in today. Thanks for being here with us. Next week we get cookies at 10 o'clock. Okay? Thank you.